and really a pioneer of research and uh, 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 not only fundamental basic science research in this space, but someone that's really spearheaded efforts to bring this, uh, these concepts into the uh, clinical market is Dr. Kevin Tracy, and I'm happy to uh, introduce him as our next speaker. Kevin? Thank you very much, Doug. Um, good afternoon, New York City. <laughs> Billy Joel said that Saturday night, and it worked for him, so I thought I would try it. I was dying to say that. So I am a uh, neurosurgeon that has been studying inflammation for 30 years. And that's an unusual combination, which happened to me for two reasons. The first was um, a real tragedy. My mother um, died when I was five years old, very suddenly, of a brain tumor. And at the time, after her funeral, I didn't go to her funeral, but at the time afterwards, her father was a professor of pediatrics at Yale. And he was my grandfather, of course. And I remember talking to him many weeks later and asking him what happened. And he, he said, well, your mother had a tumor in her brain, and it was like a crab. And so as a five-year-old, I had this horrible vision of, of, this, of this terrible thing in my mother's brain. And I said, well, why didn't the surgeon take it out? And my grandfather said, well, he could have taken out the body of the crab, but the legs of the crab spread, would have spread throughout different parts of her brain, and if he had pulled those all out, she would have had tremendous damage. And I learned as a five-year-old how important the brain is to controlling how you feel, how you think, how you move, how you speak, how you hope, how you dream. And I said to him, someone should do something about that. And he said to me, I think you should. And so 22 years later, I was uh, working at the New York Hospital studying to be a brain surgeon with Russell Patterson, just not a few blocks from here. And the second thing happened. I met uh, Janice. Um, I met her 30 years ago last month. And she was 11 months old and had crawled across the kitchen floor while her grandmother was cooking spaghetti. And she crawled behind her grandmother's legs as the woman turned to drain the boiling water into the sink. And she stumbled and spilled the boiling water on her grandchild. And Janice's face wasn't burned, but she, the rest of her body was. She had scald wounds over 90% of her body. And it was a terrible injury, and it was a terrible tragedy. And I can't think of it without getting sad. She became very, very ill of, from sepsis. She had a, 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 uh, several bouts where she nearly died of, of shock from infection that came in through her now ineffective um, barriers because of her damaged skin. And believe it or not, she was getting better and was going to go home. And the day before she was supposed to go home, she was having a baby bottle in a nurse's arms rocking in a rocking chair, and I was standing in the doorway. And Janice rolled her eyes back and died. And I was right there. And I ran in, and I took her in my arm, and I gave her CPR, and I gave her mouth to mouth, and we worked on her for a couple of hours, and she was gone. And as overwhelmingly sad as this was, it was even worse because I couldn't answer her parents' questions or her family's questions about what happened. Why did she go into shock? Well, bacterial toxins. Well, did you find any bacteria? No, we didn't find any bacteria. Well, did you find any toxins? No, we didn't find any toxins. Well, then why did she go into shock? Inflammation. And so at that point in June of 1985, um, I rotated um, into the laboratory at Rockefeller with colleagues at Rockefeller and Cornell and began to study inflammation. And what I learned at the time, the dogma was, is that inflammation is a normal healing process which, if controlled, is very good for you, but it can spin out of control. And if inflammation becomes uncontrolled, as it did in Janice's case, you can die. Now, the, the approach we took, at the time we knew about rubor, calor, dolor, and and, uh, and two more, swelling and pain and redness and, 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 and insufficient organ function. But there was no understanding of the molecular basis of this. And so our approach was to study the molecules that we could identify that caught, were necessary and sufficient to cause inflammation like Janice had, shock. And, and the molecule we focused on today is, is called TNF. And what we showed is that TNF is both necessary and sufficient to cause the damage that, Jan that, that happened to Janice and that happens in many other inflammatory diseases. 
Now, this molecule has been conserved in millions of years of evolution because it's good for you. The right amount of TNF is important for wound healing, for host defense, and for normal metabolic and immunometabolic functions. But clearly, the overproduction of TNF can, can, can be lethal. And to prove that, what we did is we developed monoclonal antibodies against TNF in baboons with infection. And as we, a paper we published in Nature in 1987 has been cited thousands of times. It was the first paper to use monoclonal anti-TNF as a therapy. And what we showed is if you take the TNF out of the infected animal, the animal's fine. And you just, you just heard a brilliant lecture from, uh, from Matt a few minutes ago, which spoke of the importance of the host response. It is the host response that, that decides whether you live or die. If you remove the host response, in this case TNF, without touching the bacteria, you can, you can prevent the, the death of these animals. These molecules, monoclonal anti-TNF antibodies, are now used in millions of patients to treat diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. And I call this concept the cytokine theory of disease. And this idea is now validated in clinical use for cytokine targets against TNF, IL-1, and IL-6. And it's changed the way we think about, about biology. And importantly, these molecules sell at the rate of $50 billion per year. It's 5% of the world's pharmaceutical industry since basically 1994. That's when the first antibodies were uh, uh, successful in clinical trials of rheumatoid arthritis. So in, 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 that, in that time frame, having sort of seen how quickly the idea could move forward, I became very excited about making additional molecules that could be used therapeutically. And in the mid-90s, when I moved to my current location at the Feinstein Institute, I developed with my colleagues a molecule we named CNI-1493 to block TNF. And we wrote about 50 papers on this molecule, and we put it in clinical trials for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and it's still working its way through clinical development. That's another story, why things take so long, but we don't have time for that. And this molecule was very, very interesting, and we were studying it, and we were putting it in the brains of animals with stroke. And what we expected to happen was that when we put the TNF inhibitor in the brains of animals with stroke, that it would block the TNF, and it did that. What we didn't expect is that when we looked in the immune system, in the spleen and the liver of these animals with the very small amounts of drug in the brain, is that it was also blocked. And this made no sense whatsoever, absolutely no way to explain this, because I had been taught and all of my colleagues had learned that the immune system and the nervous system were separate. And if you were studying neuroscience, when you got to the immunology chapter, the professor told you to take the rest of the day off. And if you were studying immunology, the, the neuroscience professor told you, you know, not to worry about that either. So these were very separate. So we had to figure out how could this signal get from the brain to the peripheral immune system. And after months of work, we realized that perhaps these signals were going through the vagus nerve. And to prove that, very complicated experiment, we cut the vagus nerve. <laughs> and when we cut the vagus nerve and put the drug in the brain, now the production of TNF continued uninhibited. And so, so we, we had discovered in 1998 that the vagus nerve controlled the immune system. And for the last 20 years, we've been, not, not 20 years, for the last 16 years, we've been figuring out how exactly that works, which I'll summarize in about four minutes. <laughs> Basically, if you... Um, think of the story I just told you. If, if you're a macrophage in the spleen making TNF and you're getting signals from the vagus nerve that turn you off, you don't know if those signals were turned on because someone put CNI 1493 in the brain or somebody connected an electrode to the vagus nerve. And so that's what we did. We connected, I started, I went to the operating room and I got a handheld um, nerve stimulator that you use and Jeff uses all the time to to stimulate the facial nerve where it goes over the pituitary, it goes over the acoustic neuroma so you don't cut the facial nerve. Got a, got a, got a handheld nerve stimulator, it looks about this big. And we put it on the vagus nerves of rats and mice and we turned it on and all of a sudden now this, this electrical signal was sufficient to block the production of TNF in these animals. And so it looks like this. This is a paper in Nature that was written by a postdoc with Mila Borovakova at that time. And in the, the first bar, the sham bar, animals don't normally make TNF. In the white bar, if you give endotoxin, they make a lot of TNF, enough to kill them. If you cut the vagus nerves, it's like cutting the brake line in a car. Now they make too much TNF. 
goes up. On the other hand, if you electrically stimulate the vagus nerve, you block the production of TNF. If you look at, because TNF causes shock, I told you about Janus, if you look at what happens in the middle line, animals given endotoxin go into shock. If you cut the vagus nerve, the line is shifted to the left. They go into shock sooner. And if you electrically stimulate the vagus nerve, the animals are protected from shock. And so here was sort of the day that we went, on the back, went out to lunch and wrote on the back of a napkin, take a nerve stimulator, implant it in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, turn it on, block the TNF, and treat the rheumatoid arthritis. And I don't have that napkin. I wish I did. It would have been a great slide after this morning from MIT. But I do have a memory of, and of who I was having lunch with, and, and they can testify that we did draw it on the back of a napkin. Before we got to that point, however, it became critically important to understand the molecular mechanisms underlying this idea. And so that, that is what we did from 1998 until the clinical trial, was we mapped the circuit. And we followed those electrical signals into the spleen. And what you can see here from work done by Mauricio uh, Rosa Spolina, then a grad student in the lab, on the top are red stained cells. These are stained red because these are cells in the spleen that are making TNF. These cells make 90% of the TNF that gets into the bloodstream. And so the antibodies are revealing these because we've counterstained them with the red. On the other hand, if you electrically stimulate the vagus nerves of those animals in panels C and D, the red is turned off. The individual cells are turned off. And so now we were able to focus on what is the mechanism that the electrical signal is transduced to turn off those red TNF producing cells. And it turns out that the electrical signal actually goes through another cell. So this is a science paper, again from Mauricio, co-first authored by Peter Olofsson. The cell in green is actually a lymphocyte. And it's green because it's expressing choline acetyltransferase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme in the biosynthesis of acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter that turns off the TNF in those red cells. And so the way this works is the electrical signal goes through the red line, through the splenic nerve. It releases norepinephrine onto that green T cell, which makes acetylcholine, which goes over to the red macrophage, signals through alpha-7 receptors, and turns off the TNF. And for those of you that didn't follow that, you weren't supposed to, here's a picture. So this is from a couple months ago in Scientific American. And the point of this picture is it maps out what I just said. And the point of this picture is that this circuit is not the only circuit that does this. This is, this is the first clearly understood circuit that does this. This is the white paper for the future to map 20 more such circuits that, that control 20 different aspects of the immune response that are involved in 20 more diseases. But, but it's, a, it's a scalable and replicable approach to a problem. And, and in this particular approach, we can follow the signal up the vagus nerve in red, which is incited by the presence of bacteria or inflammation which activates a reflex response, which goes back down the vagus nerve in blue to culminate in the spleen, in this case, on those T cells, which are on um, your left, my left too here. And the T cells make the acetylcholine, which switches off the TNF, and the macrophage is on the right. And so this is, this is the take home point of this talk, is that this is approach to bioelectronic medicine in which you start just like you do when you make a drug. You start with the drug target. You start with the molecular basis of the disease. In this case, it's TNF. And then you say, OK, what am I going to do about that target? Am I going to turn it on or turn it off? You don't, you don't, as the next step, make a drug. You actually, in this approach, you say, what are the neurotransmitters that I can map or, or, or discover or control to control the target? And then you say, what are the nerves that control the neurotransmitters? And then you make a device. And the availability of that device allows you to control precisely a drug target in a specific tissue without side effects. Because nerves, when you're doing it precisely, do what they're supposed to do. They don't have side effects. Now, you can obviously have a wound infection or some other problem from the way you do the device. But as an operating principle, controlling these circuits to control molecular targets should be largely side effect free. So the question we had at this point in the story in 1998 on the back of the napkin was do a clinical trial. In around 2000, I started a company called Setpoint. And some years later, uh, we were able to do that clinical trial. My full disclosure is I was a co-founder of Setpoint. 
at the completion of this trial, I resigned from the board of the company. I'm a consultant at that point now, but I'm not on the board. And this is the first group of patients that were studied uh, with rheumatoid arthritis in Europe, treated with implanting a vagus nerve stimulator to inhibit TNF, as we've been talking about. And so what you're looking at in blue are the DAS-28 scores. So DAS-28 is the clinical composite score of swollen tender joints, how the patient feels on a pain scale, and their serum levels, and that's very important, of course, of CRP, a marker of, of inflammation. And, and, and what you can see in blue is that the patients had a, a significant improvement uh, in the um, turning on of the vagus nerve stimulator on day zero, and that the improvement persisted uh, for 42 days. On day 42, the stimulator was turned off, and the patient started to get worse, and on day 56, it was turned back on again, and the recovery is slower. The clinical molecular target is TNF, and that's mapped in red. And you can see that the turning on of the vagus nerve stimulator turns off the TNF. So this, this has been tremendously exciting. Um, I flew over to Bosnia, and I met the first patient in this trial. He was a big guy. Um, who uh, was about at the time 45 years old and had several kids. He was unable to work, unable to play with his children. He had too much pain. He lied around on his couch all day with swollen hands and feet. Some days he couldn't button his shirt. He enrolled in the trial, and he was the first patient, and he had a dramatic response. Uh, within weeks, he was feeling better. Within, within the first 28 days, he started playing ping pong with his kids. It's a big sport in Bosnia. And Two weeks after that, he felt so good after having been on the couch for almost three years, he started running around and playing tennis and, of course, promptly hurt his knee because he was out of shape, which was a disaster because the clinical trial endpoints include swollen tender joints. So he got worse. <laughs> so his doctors had to tell him to take it easy after having been homebound for years. There's a story that was picked up by the New York Times a year ago, May, of a woman in Amsterdam. Oh, in Bosnia, they don't have biologics. They just have methotrexate and steroids and NSAIDs. And so that's, that's one of the reasons we were in Bosnia, was to treat naive patients. But in Amsterdam, they have everything, as you know. <laughs> and and though, there's, the New York Times published a picture of a woman who identified herself in the blog. And she was a data analyst at a, a big computer company in Amsterdam. And she was unable to pick up a pencil some days at work. And she's now bicycling 26 miles uh, on weekends to the Dutch coast. She had failed five biologicals, five, because people like to talk about placebo effect. And I like to say, if she's going to have a placebo response, why didn't she have it after one of the first five? So this is very exciting, and the future is even more exciting. Um, the, the idea of doing this is not that the vagus nerve is a cure-all. The vagus nerve has 80 to 100,000 fibers. And the challenge is to map the discrete circuits, as you heard from Doug, that control the discrete components that are druggable or therapeutically targetable. The white space on this is huge. Um, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, hypertension, inflammatory bowel disease, Alzheimer's and cancer are on this list, not because they're big, expensive problems in the world. They're on this list because there's preclinical data for every one of these. And the preclinical data are either that there are druggable targets under the influence of neurotransmitters, that can theoretically be modified by, by implanting a device, or they're on this list because there's preclinical or clinical evidence that it works. And, and, and there's, there, there's a rapidly growing body of clinical evidence now for using uh, nerve stimulation to treat inflammatory bowel disease, which is another uh, indication for using anti-TNF antibodies. So um, I'm extremely optimistic about where we are today and where this, is, where this is going. This is not some future sci-fi story. This is happening now. And I think we're in a unique position um, to drive this forward. I will tell you, none of this would have happened uh, if it hadn't been for DARPA. Um, the, the support of DARPA in the early days of this program was such that nobody else would have paid for this. And I think in some ways, the opportunity to leverage that into the future is stronger now today than it even was when DARPA got into this in the first place. Thank you.